And uh, I'm happy to introduce a new friend of mine, Tim Ehrman and Lisa Bertou from the uh, United States and uh, with a long history in the NAI organization and now working uh, as, what do you say? Um, consultants. Consultants. Uh, and your, the name of your consultant firm is Portfield Associates. Yes. And now we're going to give us an example of what you did. Okay, so we Good morning, everyone. Uh, I was very interested in what Hong had to say about ecotourism in Korea, um, because Korea, as you know, is a very industrial, uh, organized, up-to-date country. And we've been doing work recently in some countries that are not quite so industrialized. Uh, so we wanted to bring you a couple of examples of community-based ecotourism which is a little different, defined a little differently than uh, what he was suggesting in, in Korea. Um, most specifically, we've been working in uh, Malaysia and Rwanda, so we wanted to show you, compare and contrast a couple of examples from those uh, places because they've really shown what can be accomplished if everybody works together. So, um, when we talk about community-based ecotourism, what we're talking about, first let me, let me ask this, you're all familiar with the term ecotourism? Generally speaking, everybody knows, has an idea that when we talk about ecotourism, uh, in general we're talking about tourism that helps contribute to the sustainability of the local environment, uh, both social environment and natural cultural environment. Okay, so when we talk about community-based ecotourism, we're talking a little bit different approach only in that the community is actively involved in deciding what that tourism activity will be. They come in and decide for themselves rather than having somebody else come in and say, we think it'd be a great idea to do ecotourism here the community actually comes together and decides for themselves what their goals are, what their core values, their common interests and needs are, and how best to approach resolving those issues. Now, in some cases, they um, may be looking at, um, in both Malaysia and Rwanda, we're going to show you a couple of different approaches. In Malaysia, people are, uh, that we were working with were actively living a traditional lifestyle. And so by bringing tourism into that traditional lifestyle, you can imagine there's some immediate uh, disparities between what people expect and what actually happens. So we'll go into those in just a minute. They may also be presenting something, as was the case in Rwanda, where that traditional lifestyle uh, is the old way. It's not necessarily what they're doing now. And so what they're doing with their communities is uh, a blend of sort of recreated traditional lifestyles and current lifestyles. So two very different approaches. Uh, either way, they're both very concerned about providing that authenticity of experience. So they're not trying to be Disney World. They're trying to show what actually, oh my, well that, that was interesting. <laughs> okay, there we go. We don't need to go wire, you don't need to see my email today. Um, okay, so when we talk about this approach, in both cases, uh, there's some good things. And, of course, the potential for negative impacts as well. Certainly, um, just as, as Hong mentioned, there's the potential to create jobs. There's the potential to provide uh, a source of income for the local community and its members. Uh, one of the things I think that's most important for the people that we've been working with is this idea of building support and respect for the local culture. And that's not just from people who travel from afar, it's also for the local people to respect their own culture and environment. And I'm gonna show you a, a little video here in a minute where you can actually hear somebody express that. It's, it's, it's pretty interesting. 
also provides the opportunity uh, to build partnerships, not only with corporations, uh, but also with other agencies, with other countries, uh, in all sorts of ways. So a lot of good things that can happen as a result of uh, community-based ecotourism. On the other hand, there is also the potential for some negative impacts, and those have to be taken into consideration. So you might have outside influences that come in and, and try to exploit local resources or local people. Uh, that's a very real concern. And very often when things get turned over to uh, chain management, uh, you understand what I mean with uh, like a chain, like a, uh, I don't want to pick on anybody in particular, but let's just say Walmart. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or the Radisson Hotel, any, any kind of chain organization that comes in that has multiple uh, outlets in multiple countries may have its own approach that doesn't fit the local environment. And so if that's the case, sometimes those corporate interests can come in and exploit uh, the local people and resources. But it's not just corporations that do that. Sometimes government agencies do that as well. And so this is why community-based ecotourism, that word community-based is so important because that's the key. They must be involved. Um, certainly there's also the potential for creating environmental issues. There's always the chance that the very thing you came to enjoy will be used up and that defies the whole definition of, of ecotourism, so we have to be constantly vigilant to make sure that that does not occur. Uh, may also create social issues. Uh, in some cases, although it provides jobs for individuals in the community, it may also bring in influences uh, that are not so good. Drugs, alcohol, uh, other types of things that uh, are negative influences in the community. So again, there's the positive, the negative, and you have to constantly weigh the two and decide what's, what's going to be uh, the best. Now the way to do that, I think, is good planning, first off. Make sure that you understand what you're trying to achieve and then how you get there. Uh, we have a, a book out, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, this morning because uh, we're a little short on time, but we are doing uh, another workshop on Tuesday that will go into this heart concept at so, in some depth. And um, so if you're interested in that more, we'll sign up for the workshop. There's still some spaces left in that for Tuesday. But basically our heart model says that you tr are trying to be holistic with your experience that you're creating, that it's engaging, that it actually uh, connects with people on an emotional and an intellectual level, uh, that it's appropriate for the audience, but also appropriate for the resource. It has to be what the community wants. Uh, it has to be rewarding, again, both for the audience and for the community itself and for the resource itself. And then thematic. Uh, we're big believers in the idea of thematic interpretation uh, being the idea that that theme or whatever drives the experience starts a conversation about that experience and about the ideas that you come up with during that experience. So it's, it's what travels with you after you leave and continues the conversation in your head and with other people uh, about the experience that you've had. It's basically what you share with everybody else after you've had that experience. So good planning is absolutely key. Also, we think training is important. And I'm, I'm going to be curious. I know there's another presentation, maybe next, uh, after the coffee break, uh, John Cole and Marisol are going to do that is about uh, training local people. And we've, we've found this to be incredibly rewarding. We think it's important to train not only in interpretation, communication techniques, but also if you're going to develop community-based ecotourism, they must have training in cultural competency. That 
is what we're talking about there is sharing your culture with somebody else and understanding their culture enough that you can communicate clearly with them. Not just language, but things like when we were in uh, Malaysia, the, the cultural norm there is to take off your shoes before you enter someone's house. Well, we don't do that in the United States. If somebody asks you to take off your shoes, other than in Hawaii, but if somebody asks you to take off your shoes, you go, really? <laughs> and so, so that, just those little cultural differences that we have, uh, helping people understand who their audience might be and how to deal with them culturally is very important. Uh, we think also this idea of, of looking at things from the visitor's perspective, very important, understanding how to create a complete holistic visitor experience. It's not just about uh, what you say, it's all pieces of the experience. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. And then finally, business management. Because when we talk about community-based ecotourism, we're talking about putting the community in charge of their own business. And if they don't understand how to, how to run a business, it will fail. So rather than set them up for failure, we need to give them training in such things, just business management practices, accounting, how to keep the books, what you charge, uh, how you report back to the government. All of those things are critical as well. So uh, in terms of creating training, I think uh, the most successful uh, training pieces we can create are those which are customized for the individual situation. So having said that as an overview, um, let's go to Malaysia, where we met with representatives from three different uh, communities, the Ulugero, Gambak, and uh, Sasaran Sunghai Bulo communities. And each of them were very different. Uh, they, they all were in different locations, but these were indigenous communities. Now, Malaysia, how many of you have been to Malaysia? A few, okay. So if you only go to Kuala Lumpur, you think Malaysia is this big, industrialized, uh, up-to-date, modern city, because Kuala Lumpur is that, certainly. But when you get off into the highlands or down to the coastal villages, it is very much... Uh, a, uh, these indigenous villages are very unique. Now, I have to tell you that in Malaysia, the indigenous people, called the Orang Asli, were only recognized as human beings by their government in the year 2000. Think about that. They were treated as wildlife. And it's a horrifying story. But what's happened uh, in more recent times in the last decade is that they have uh, gotten their uh, civil rights. They're being treated much, much better um, than they were previously. And part of what's happened is, although the government has created villages for them to move to, most of them used to live very separately, uh, although in loose communities, now they're condensed into smaller communities. Part of what that challenge has created is what used to be farming and fishing villages very spread out have become condensed. So they've had to figure out ways in which they can earn income in these condensed communities outside of their normal traditional uh, livelihoods of farming and fishing. So one of the things that they have uh, created is this idea of community-based ecotourism. Let's help people understand our culture and uh, that will help us in the meantime. So they are trying to create a source of income, um, but they are also very much trying to build a culture of respect for the Orang Asli people and the tribes that are left. Part of what they do is um, a home stay and a home visit program. So kind of two different approaches. Home stay, where you actually go live with a family for a while in a very traditional sort of way. Now, when I say traditional way, <laughs> like many places around the world, it's a little bit of a mix these days. If you go into a home, 
uh, in the Ulu uh, Garo village, or excuse me, the Gombok village, what you'll find is the traditional home built on stilts, uh, made of bamboo, and you go in and you sit on the floor and you eat, and in the next room there's a big screen TV. Okay, so it's this weird sort of mix of uh, both traditional and modern lifestyles that are, that's occurring kind of all over the world uh, when you see these traditional villages. So the home visit program is where you simply go visit a family. You might go into somebody's home to have dinner. There's no restaurant in the village. You would just go to somebody's home and share dinner with them. And while you're having dinner, you'd have a conversation about the culture. Uh, nature tours, and other traditional activities, which I'll show you in just a moment. In some of these uh, communities, uh, such as Ulugero, they've created a community center uh, to host some of these activities. And it also serves as a meeting place for the community, a place where they can gather, and uh, that's, that's been a very important piece. Now, what we did there, uh, our project in Malaysia was funded by the Japan uh, Interagency uh, Cooperating Agency and International Cooperating Agency, or JICA. And what they asked us to do was to work with these folks, look at what the experience was, conduct an assessment of that, and then develop some training tools that would help them improve that. So that's what we did. Part of what we did was create this... Uh, 10 training videos, and the training videos that we did, that should have started, and it didn't. And, hmm. that's a video that's not going to run. So, I tried that, and it didn't, didn't take off. But I think given the time, since we're running a little bit short, we'll, we'll just maybe skip that, unfortunately. Um, what we did with these 10 training videos, we had a series of um, pieces that we, we developed scripts for, and we, had, uh, we filmed these people doing activities that demonstrated what we were training them on. So use of themes in programs, cultural competency, uh, those sorts of things. This series of 10 videos, each one deals with a short segment. It's only about four minutes long uh, that has a very specific topic. And then we used the local people to illustrate what they were doing. Now in this one, the one I wanted to show you, we actually had them talk about the benefits of community-based ecotourism. And for this one, we did not write a script. We simply asked them in their own words, why do you want to do this? Why do you think community-based ecotourism is important? And I was hoping to share that with you because it's so heartwarming to hear them say, this matters because if we don't do this, we will be lost as a culture. And so, uh, I, <clears throat> if you want to see that at some point, come see me sometime, and I'll be happy to pull out the computer and show you the, com the, the uh, thing. So part of what they do in these villages is they do, they do share life skills, traditional life skills, and some of these are still being practiced today, very much so. Uh, fishing, uh, using the, the throw net, uh, cockle fishing down in the bays, which is a, it's not easy. You, you scoop along the, the base of the river. You know what I mean when I say cockle? It's a little shell uh, mussel-like thing that um, is actually quite delicious, and there we are eating our catch. Uh, because like many community-based ecotourism programs, part of that experience is the local food as well. And so we ate what we caught, uh, and it was quite good. Music, uh, dance, those sorts of cultural aspects of creative uh, things. We had uh, this gentleman who showed us how to, to not only make, but how to play a nose flute. I don't know if you've ever tried that. It's not easy. <laughs> 
but, but it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. And I, I chose this picture because, again, you can kind of see this, this um, old and new. This is his home. This is where he lives. And this is where he brought us to talk to us about music, where he creates instruments, plays instruments. And you can look on the, on the back wall there. You'll see a, a modern calendar. You'll see fishing nets that he's created, that he's, he puts together. That's, that, those are hand-woven baskets that they use to go to the market. Okay, so that's still very much a blend of old and new. Uh, they did invite us to a traditional dance. And uh, that was a lot of fun. They showed us how to weave uh, things. Weaving is a big part of the culture there. Uh, also the blow guns, which are still used in some cases for hunting. This is a six foot long blow gun. They put a little dart in it and blow it. And they had us working with a target, you know, to see if we could be accurate with it. Um, happy to say that blow gun now lives uh, in our living room. It's up on the wall. And uh, as do these baskets, the fishing baskets and some of the bracelets. Now, these things are things that they have made traditionally for years. They're now sales items. So they're still using some of these things on a day-to-day -day basis, but they're also providing them as sales items, as souvenir handicrafts for people to take home. Uh, so they'll teach you how to make them, but they'll also sell them to you as well. So they have generate, they're generating income off of that. Uh, the homestays and, and home visits, again, very much traditional. Uh, I think you can even, is that the TV? In, that is the TV in there. So you can actually see the uh, mix. Now the nature tours are interesting because this is what we traditionally think of as the eco-tour part. Uh, but, but we, with community-based ecotourism, we're looking at the bigger picture as well. So with this, this was important because they have the bird wing butterflies, which are these enormous, beautiful butterflies, and the Rafflesia flowers. You familiar with Rafflesia? Is the, um, it's got a bud that's the size of a basketball, and when it opens, it's a meter across, three feet across, and it smells really bad. Okay, so what they were doing previous to developing this program, the local people were going out, capturing these butterflies and selling them for a nickel apiece, five cents, to the local museums and the local uh, market vendors who would then sell them to tourists at a much higher rate. They'd press them under glass and sell them for many dollars. And so the local people were wiping out their butterfly population to make a nickel, five cents for each butterfly. Rafflesia buds, they would go up into the hills, pick the buds, sell them to the museum shops, where again, they would be paid 25 cents a bud. They were being sold for hundreds of dollars in the museum shops. And they're wiping out the supply of them by gathering them this way. It's not sustainable. So what they did was they said, wow, if we begin a tourism project where we can take people to see the bird wing butterflies in their natural habitat, they can take photographs, all the photographs they want, and we will charge them $50 for each tourist. And we'll take them out to see the butterflies and we'll take them out to see the flowers. You do the math. It begins to get much more sustainable. They're not taking things out of the environment. They're encouraging people to go out. Now they talk about how they respect the environment. It's a whole different, it's flipped their relationship because they need for that to be a sustainable product. So now they're taking care of it in a way that they never even thought about before. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and switch over and let Tim take, tell you about Rwanda and when you can kind of compare the two. I can't get out of here. Rwanda, many of you know mostly from the 1994 genocide. A million people killed in less than a year, most of them in less than a month. It's one of the smallest nations in Africa. It's in East Africa in a 
kind of a union like the European Union with Kenya, Tanzania, Burundi, and uh, Uganda. But it's also the most densely populated nation on the African continent with 13 million people in an area the size of the state of Maryland in the United States, a very small country. Um, Nyungwe National Park is located in southwest Rwanda and the U.S. Aid for International Development is there working with a program called Beautiful Nyungwe, where they're trying to build uh, the economy and community-based tourism in the Nyungwe National Park area. Same thing as Lisa mentioned, income, jobs, respect. Um, traditional housing on site and recreated cultural villages. This, Lisa mentioned this. These villages are not what they now live in. They live in brick or, or mud adobe type homes with tin roofs, but they've recreated their traditional villages of 50 and 100 years ago to show people what it was like. They use a performance-based script that they know very well. It looks natural to us because we don't know their songs and stories, but they certainly are performing and have been coached and directed in how to do it. Uh, their crafts, many of their crafts, they kind of lost through the years, and they're teaching young people how to do them now and bringing them back because they know that these uh, tourism items are valuable and uh, as a take-home memorabilia. Our involvement was to go there and do an assessment of the guides program, to do some informal coaching, and to do two specific courses. The Certified Interpretive Guide course, which is done for anyone who does programs. It's a four-day course. We did it in five days. Despite English being their official language of Rwanda, it really, for most of their history, has been Kenya Rwandan and French. And so people are really having to learn English as the official language of the country. So um, we spent five days doing a four-day course to make it less challenging. We also did the host course for a group of people who work in restaurants, hotels, uh, drivers, support roles, to try to help them understand that they also have a value in helping people connect with the local resources. We'll show you how this looks. These recreated villages tell the story of the period when kings ruled in Rwanda. And uh, it's, uh, we didn't quite understand what they were doing, but um, this is not, not the king. The guy in the orange shirt is playing the king. He is another villager, and it might be a different person playing the king the next time you go there. One of the stories they tell through this cultural program is how brides were once selected. They were chosen by warriors from a neighboring village who would come to their village, and there would be young women, 13 years old, waiting to see who was to be selected. And uh, a warrior would demonstrate his prowess with a spear, and uh, he would select a bride from that village and take her away. You're getting their songs and dances throughout this, which are very lively, and after they get done, they want to involve you in it. In fact, they invited us to get in the basket and be carried, and we decline. But in a sense, uh, they, they will over-involve you if you let them. Yeah, our videos aren't working here, but if you want to see them, we really don't have the time for them right now as well. But we have them and be happy to share them with you on a smaller group basis. Some of the things they don't sell that they should are like the bells that they wear on their ankles. They think of them as just something you use at a traditional dance. We said, where are those for sale? Oh, we don't have them. Uh, so they're still learning, and this program with USAID is coaching them on what's in your culture that other people would love to carry away, and how can you bring back some of those items. They really don't recognize it. They, they view those bells as just something they have around that they can pull out if they're going to do a dance. We were staying, doing training at the Katabi Cultural Village. There's three communities around Nyungwe National Park that have cultural village programs, and they're each a little bit different. Uh, Chamadongo is in a chimpanzee community. Uh, they literally have 
We could see when we were looking at chimpanzees, people's homes just a short distance away. And so part of the challenge is how do you get them to value the chimpanzees and not view them as this enemy that charges into your garden and steals your bananas and papayas and, and ripe fruit when it's available? Well, the fees that are charged for cultural programs and that are charged for coming into the park or taking a hike share a percentage of that back with the local community. So they view the tourist as a contributor to their economic welfare. And if they didn't get that, it would be a real intrusion because tourists do take up uh, the highways. That, that's where they walk to and from everything. So uh, their cultural food is largely vegetarian, bananas, plantains, uh, various kinds of uh, manioc or tapioca root and the tapioca leaves, beans, and uh, cabbages and onions. If you go to Katabi, where we were doing the training, Rick, the gentleman on the left, is a cultural guide, and you can have the dance program that you saw on previous slides, or he will take you on an agricultural tour around the community. And this is a tea community. So when you see those hills, those terraced hills, are all growing a very high quality black tea that's exported all over the world. And it's run as a cooperative. And in other words, the village owns the tea fields. There's a tea company located there. You can go out as a local person and pick tea all day, take it to the cooperative, sell it to the tea company, They'll package it and get it off, distributed around the world, and you got a day's pay. And you can go when you want, and you can not go when you don't want, but it's a shared resource. This is, for us, this was a fun part of the story, and they're showing you the blend of, uh, there's a lot of birds. It's excellent birding. 268 species of birds in the Yungwe National Park, 13 species of primates with chimpanzees being the premier one, but the Angolan colobus monkeys and red tail monkeys and other things are quite interesting. And the birding in the village was almost as good as in the park. They have not eaten birds traditionally in uh, this part of the world, so they've survived. One of the programs of Nyungwe and Ziza, which means beautiful Nyungwe, is to help them understand what local handicrafts are going to appeal to tourists and to help them develop some methods of doing it. They didn't just go with tourist items. You'll see on their peace baskets, those uniquely shaped baskets on the left, but over on the right it says that they're also making sweaters. Um, the program realized that these women have capacity to produce a lot more items out of the cultural uh, village community than uh, current tourist consumers can buy. So they bought them some looms on which they're making sweaters that they sell back to the local schools and to uh, local people. So they've kind of combined uh, the ecotourism commercial trade with the needs of the community for other kinds of items and let the program do both. When we were doing training there, we we're doing the host course. The gentleman in the uh, horizontally striped uh, sweater is the superintendent, or he's called the chief warden of the park. And uh, Louis uh, Rugerin Inyame um, is interesting in that he stayed through the entire host course. He earned the credential. Present with him on the left is a young woman who's the receptionist at Forest uh, Lodge in Nyungwe. That's a for two people, that's a $400 a night lodge, very high end. Uh, it's nestled in the tea fields. He's with other people from the various villages, Kitabi, Chumadongo, and uh, Banda villages. So this, these folks know each other. They're getting training in common together. They're aware that their products need to blend and create a diverse array of tourism experiences. And they don't want to compete with each other. They want to do things that, uh, thank you, help them. Now, the guides in the park are taking people out to see chimpanzees, and that may not look like a great view of a chimpanzee. We could see it better than that. It was hard to photograph it better than that in the dim light of rainforest. Um, 
to go into Nyungwe, you have to take a guided hike because they have issues of not wanting people to get off the trails and wander. There are still, you're near Democratic Republic of Congo. You don't want to go some distance off into the park and maybe meet a poacher or a, a person coming to get bush meat to sell back to the war in the Congo. When we train guides, these gu guiding is one of the most lucrative professions in Rwanda because you may be paid a very small amount by the government, but the tips you get from one tourist may equal the week's salary for somebody uh, working at a physical labor job. They were enthusiastic in both the host and the guide course. They really appreciated not only getting the skills, but getting the credentials. They wanted that NAI credential. They had heard of the Certified Interpretive Guide and Host. When we handed out the little badges that go with that, they put them on and wore them very proudly. And uh, they never wore name tags before. One of the things we introduced is to increase the conversation. You need to have your own name on your shirt. Volcanoes National Park is what Rwanda is known for. And in fact, much of the tourism is what I would call high-graded tourism. The tourism provider brings people to Tanzania to see lions and uh, savanna wildlife and then runs them over for a day to Rwanda. We, we've put together an eco-tour ourselves that takes people to all three of the big national parks. Volcanoes is an amazing story. How many of you know the Diane Fossey Gorillas in the Mist story? the woman from America who lived with the gorillas. She was opposed to people being brought out to habituated gorillas. Um, Amy Vetter and Bill Weber, a couple, a biologist and a rural uh, community development person, came there and disagreed with her. They said, we think it's going to save the gorillas to have ecotourism. So they started bringing uh, tourists into the community the government was going to build a $70,000 a year producing cattle operation and cut down most of what was left of gorilla habitat. The gorillas would have been literally locked out of a place to live. Amy Vetter and Bill Weber said, we think you can make more than $70,000 a year off of tourism with gorillas. It's, uh, it made $7,000 and 78, a million and 89, it's estimated right now to be bringing in 20 million a year. That's just gorilla permits at $750 a person for a visit. Now, there's another perhaps 60 or $80 million that's the hotels, food and lodging, transportation, personal guides, drivers, and other income that comes from it. It's become one of the most important drivers for the nation, but they still are lacking great guide training in this particular park or host training in the community around it. And they need it because they say, give me $750 to go see a gorilla. What they need to be saying is your $750 is not only helping protect gorillas in Rwanda, it's an investment in local communities. Because an important part of this story is when you show up to see the gorillas, you first see the Sakola community dance and do performances while you're waiting to get your guide to go up and see gorillas. And people make contributions to their program after the dance. It's very important because they're going to walk you through their potato uh, and pyrethrum fields to get up to the gorillas. And so the damage done by tourists going up these trails and competing with them for space that they need for agriculture they get money back from the program for their local communities, and that's an essential part of this. Uh, the community compensation is vital to making the en entire program work. Local people have to understand why they would want tourists coming into their, into their lives and their communities. You want to do the conclusion? Well, just to wrap up, um, I think... You know, all of these approaches are all considered community-based ecotourism, although they are different. You know, some of them are very much um, looking at current lifestyles. Some are looking at uh, previous lifestyles. Some are very informal. Some are very scripted. The main thing to remember is that if you want true community-based ecotourism, the community has to be involved in deciding for themselves what their objectives are. 
and they have to be involved in that discussion about how they're going to get to uh, the end result. Uh, so that's critical. Uh, you must, must, must look at both the advantages and the disadvantages. If you're not realistic about looking at the potential for trouble, then you may fail at what you just tried to do. So be aware that good planning is critical. You have to, have to as, as painful as it is to think about what could go wrong, you have to plan for that so that it doesn't occur. Two other quick items I would say, if I may. Go. Um, Oh, you want to finish that list first? Well, I, I think you have to, uh, as I was saying, just realistically consider those and then both plan and train the people for that uh, eventuality so that you get the best experience. Because it's not just about tourism from other countries, it's about the people who live there uh, improving their own lives and their own cultures. I, I thought it was interesting in Kitabi. Uh, where they had the very scripted kind of performance tour, when I asked them, is this just for tourists? They said, no. By teaching our young people the traditional dances, we're keeping our culture alive. They said, Th that is a lost art. They actually have schools now to teach traditional dance because they have lost it. It's not being taught by families anymore. So they're actually trying to keep their own culture alive through these community-based ecotourism programs, not just for tourism, but for themselves. And I think that's, that's critically important.